What is love? You you think as much as we talk about love as a culture, uh, you think about it, like every song ever written is about love of some kind. Every movie ever made, no, actually about half of all the movies ever made are made about love. The other half are made about getting revenge on the person who destroyed my village. But the other half of all movies are made about love. Poets write about love. We talk about love. As much as we talk and write and think about love as a culture, you would think we would be able to answer this question, what is love? But it doesn't take more than a cursory view or study of our culture, or if you watch the news just a little bit, to realize that our culture, more than love, is really seeming to be defined by hate. Hate is endemic in our culture, from um, the, the political division and polarization in our culture to the bickering and breakups uh, among the elite in Hollywood to road rage and shootings. Hatred seems to be an epidemic. You know, this last week was no different for us as we saw the events in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. Uh, and if you missed, uh, haven't been watching the news Last week in Charlottesville, Virginia, members of the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacy groups gathered together to protest the removal of a Robert E. Lee statue. And of course, counter-protesters came to protest the the white supremacists, and things began to escalate, and things got violent. And by Saturday afternoon, things had escalated to the point where a 20-year-old man got behind his car intending to kill people, and he drove that car into a crowd, killing one person and injuring another 19 the governor of Virginia came out and he condemned the act. He declared a state of, uh, of emergency and he said publicly to these white supremacists that he wanted them to leave their state, that they weren't welcome in the state. And, and ever since last weekend, you know, talking heads and headlines have been debating, you know, who said what and who didn't say what and who didn't say what loud enough. But just so nobody doubts where followers of Jesus are coming from, we need to be crystal clear where we stand on issues like this that as followers of Jesus, we peacefully stand against violence and hatred in every uh, form that it takes, that we stand against prejudice and racism in all of its forms, because we follow a man who loved everybody, who uh, came to be with everybody, who accepted everybody, who died for everybody regardless of race or color or political view or morality or ethnicity. You know, uh, the church was for the most part, pretty quiet during the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s. But we need to, again, be very clear where we stand today as followers of Jesus, standing against hate, peacefully standing against violence, standing against racism in all of its forms. Again, because we follow this man who loved so well. But what does it mean to love? You know, he gave us these commandments. He, he told us that this above all would be what would mark us as his followers more than our morality or our holiness, more than what we believe, more than what we think. It is how we love. He said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus said that we are to love one another as he has loved us, that all men would know that we are his disciples based on the fact that we love one another. But what does love look like? All summer long, we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, and today we come to this chapter, this beautiful chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, known of as the love chapter. And in it, the Apostle Paul is going to write the most powerful, most poignant, most beautiful prose, perhaps in all of history, certainly on the topic of love. These words are so beautiful that they're often read at weddings, Maybe it was read at your wedding. Parts of it was read at, were read, read at your wedding. Maybe they will be when you're married. Sometimes we have these things. Maybe they're hanging on a plaque or a, a picture somewhere in your, your house. You have these words displayed somewhere. Maybe you have received a Hallmark card from a loved one or you've given one to a spouse declaring your love. But the interesting thing that we're going to see about this passage is that the context of this, this passage is not romantic love. It's not talking about a love between a husband and a wife, although it certainly applies there. What we're going to see is the context is right here. It's the church. We are to love one another. If we remember the context of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians is a letter that Paul wrote 2,000 years ago to a church that was really messed up. 
They were living in a culture that was messed up. They, they lived in an extravagantly, extravagantly immoral culture. And that immorality and that messed upness of the culture was bleeding into the church. So the church was jacked up too. And, and they were divided and they weren't getting along and they were taking each other to court. And there was sexual immorality that was being tolerated. And so Paul writes this letter to say, this is what real faith looks like in a messed up world. That the gospel of Jesus Christ should make a difference in the way you live, in the way you treat one another, in the way you live together as a community. And as we get to chapters 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes what is perhaps the most beautiful and compelling and clear picture of what the church is to be. And, and in chapter 12, he, he starts, as we saw last week, with spiritual gifts and the, this metaphor of the body, that we're a body and we're all different parts of the body, we all the, a, a part to play, we all have a function to play. And Nicole talked about that this morning. And as he comes to the end of chapter 12, after talking about all these spiritual gifts, Paul writes this in the very last verse of the chapter. He says, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. He's talking about spiritual gifts. He's talking about the gifts of wisdom and mercy and encouragement and teaching and tongues and miracles and healing. He's talked about all these gifts, but then he ends by saying, eagerly desire the greater gifts, the greater spiritual gifts, and now I will show you the most excellent way. And then he's going to begin chapter 13, the love chapter. So what he's basically saying is, is that spiritual gifts are great. You should pursue spiritual gifts but there's something more important than the, than the function and the operation of your spiritual gifts. And I'm going to show you what this most excellent way is. And then again, he starts chapter 13. And so I say this just to say that the context here, and then in verse 14, or chapter 14 next week, we're going to go back to spiritual gifts. So in the middle of 12 and 14, here we find chapter 13. The context is the church. The context is us functioning together, this beautiful chapter that Paul's going to write about. And again, this is the most powerful, the most beautiful, the, the deepest, most meaningful writing that Paul has ever penned. He's going to tell us this idea of love and what it is in this high calling. And it is all in the context of the church. And we can see this right as he starts in verse 1. Look at what he says. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And so again, we can see clearly the context here is spiritual gifts in the church because he mentions at least four spiritual gifts right there as he begins to talk about love. And he, he starts by mentioning the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy to the Corinthian church because these, as we'll see next week in chapter 14, these were the two spiritual gifts that the church in Corinth coveted more than anything. These were the most valuable for them. They wanted the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy, and they argued over which was more important. And so Paul brings these up, and he says, all right, you take the gift of tongues and the gift of, of prophecy that you consider to be so valuable. You may have these gifts that, in your view, are super spiritual and give you limelight and visibility in the church. But if you operate those gifts out of love, you are, uh, without love, you are nothing. You are a resounding gong, a clanging cymbal. He goes on then to talk about the spiritual gifts of knowledge. You can have that, or you can have a gift of faith that can move mountains, but if not motivated by love, it's nothing. Paul then goes on to say in verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the, body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. So now he moves past the operation of spiritual gifts to other sacrifices, worthy sacrifices that we can make for, for Christ and for the church. Just imagine, he says, if you give everything that you have, to the poor. Imagine just liquidating all of your assets, your 401k, your bank account, getting all of the, the, the equity out of your home and taking all that money and giving it away to the poor. You'd be like, God owes me something now, right? Paul's like, no. Unless it was motivated by love, it gains you nothing. Or what about if I, if, I, if I give my life up for Jesus? What if I'm martyred for God? I give my life. What more can I give for, than, than my life? And especially if I'm like, burn on a torch and give my body up to the flames. That is like the highest form of martyrdom, right? So surely that will earn me something in God's view. And Paul says, no. If it's not motivated, if, if you're doing it for self-glorification or anything other than love, it gains you nothing. Why? Because in the kingdom of God, love is the highest value. Jesus made this so clear. When he was with us, he loved. He loved everyone. He loved well. He showed what love look, looks like. And then on that night before he died, 
He was spending time with his disciples in an upper room. He, was, he knew he was going away. He knew he was leaving the kingdom to these 12 guys. And so he gave them these final instructions. He, maybe you've heard these before, but this is what he said in that upper room. He said, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So he's telling them, it all rests on you, your plan A, right? And if you're going to let people know that you are my followers, it, it's not going to be necessarily about how holy you are or how pious you are. Those things are important. It's not going to be about how much you know. Those things are important. But if people are going to identify you as my follower, it's not going to be any of those things. It's going to be in the way you love one another. Love one another. And so again, we come to this question, well, what is love? What does that look like? Because in our culture, we have so many different ways we use the word love. That we can all be thinking different things when we hear Jesus' words that we should love one another. And if I define love the wrong way, then I could be missing the mark on this without even knowing it. I think I'm loving, but maybe I'm really not. And so let me ask you, what do you think Jesus meant when he said love one another? What does that look like? You know, if we're honest, many of us believe that what Jesus meant when he said love one another is get along. Don't fight. Don't hate each other. Just get along. And so we're tempted to believe that as long as you and I are not in active, like, combat mode, as long as we're getting along, therefore we love one another. But Jesus didn't die so that we don't hate one another. He died so that we could love one another, and he made it clear what that would look like. He said, as I have loved you, this is what I want it to look like. We're like, whoa, 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 whoa. wait a minute, because Jesus really loved us really well. Jesus loved us to the point where he said, you know what, you have sinned, you have fallen short of the glory of God, you're heading for an eternity separated from my Father, I love you so much, I am going to put myself in your place, I'm going to give you exactly what you need, I'm going to sacrifice my life so that you can live, I'm giving up my everything for you, I'm putting you and your needs above me and my needs, this is what love looks like for Jesus, and Jesus says, this is how you will be identified as my followers, if you love as I have loved you. Not in a passive kind of, I don't hate you way, but an active, Jesus, I'm giving up my life for you kind of way. But we are commanded to love one another in an active way that costs us something. And as we come back to Paul's definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, we're going to see him describe a love that costs us something. It takes us like Jesus being willing to die in some ways, in order to love in this way. And so we come back to 1 Corinthians 13, and we pick up in verse 4, and Paul begins this, this beautiful definition of what love is and what it looks like and what it doesn't look like. He states the positive, and he states the negatives. And as we read through this, just ask yourself, am I loving like this? Where do I stand? Ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. As we get to verse 4, Paul says, love is patient. And I say, boom, I'm out right there. <laughs> boom. I did three words in, and it shows my complete, utter depravity and inability to love. Because I am impatient. I am hopelessly impatient. And I don't say that in a kind of proud way, like in our culture. It's like we wear like busyness with like a badge of honor, and we wear like impatience like a badge of honor. I do not wear it with a badge of honor. I am ashamed of my impatience. I can't, can't, tell, I can't count how many times my impatience has led me to being rude and unkind to people because I value efficiency and expediency over love. Now, if you ask me which I value higher, I would say, I value love higher. But if you would watch my life in certain circumstances, I am valuing expediency and efficiency over love. And what a shame, because patience is a passive form of love. Patience is simply slowing down to the pace of the person in front of you. So, so if you're a parent and you want to be patient with your children, it's simply slowing down to the pace of your child while they're in front of you. Or if you're driving and you're behind a slow driver, patience is slowing down to the pace of the car in front of you, not just at miles per hour, but in my heart, I'm slowing down. 
They're slowing down to their pace. If I'm at the checkout line at Office Depot, patience is when I recognize the person behind the counter does not appreciate the fact that I'm in a hurry and they're taking their time. Patience is slowing down to the the pace of the person behind the counter. What a shame. The world needs more patience. I need more patience. That's what love looks like. Love is kind. Now, this is not a a passive form of love. Kindness is now this active form of love where I recognize your need and your weakness, and I give you that which you need. And so when I meet somebody who is discouraged and they need a smile, kindness smiles. Or when I meet somebody who is discouraged and needs an encouraging word, kindness speaks those encouraging words. When I, when I see somebody that needs to be somewhere really quick, kindness says, you first. The world needs more kindness. I need more kindness. I recognize the, the places in my life where kindness comes difficult. And some of the most silly places and service organizations or places where I'm being served and I expect a certain level of service and it's not coming, it's not efficient. I've had to come to the place where before I get out of my car, in certain situations, I have to say a prayer. Kindness matters. Remind myself, kindness matters. That's what love looks like. Love does not envy. To envy someone means to have negative thoughts about them because of a particular advantage you see that they have, whether it's who they are or what they have. It's the original sin. Lucifer in heaven, he was this beautiful covering cherub, but he looked at God and he saw this advantage that he believed God had, and he thought negative thoughts, and his envy of God, the person of God, the position that he had, led him to do very unloving things, and he's been tempting us to envy ever since. But that's not love. Love isn't bitter about the advantage of others. Love actively works so that I can advance you and give you advantage so that I can help you get ahead rather than be bitter because you are or seem to be ahead. Love does not boast. It is not proud. Boasting is using my words to make me feel more important or bigger than you. Pride, or to be proud, means I actually believe that I am bigger or better than you. And these clearly are not love. Anytime I use my words to belittle you or make me uh, bigger or to put me in the center of the conversation, anytime I'm feeling superior to someone around me, that is not love. That is self-love. And we clearly see that that is not what love is, not the way Jesus loved. Love is not rude. This is the opposite of kindness. It's where we actually are abrasive toward the people around us. And Paul here is most likely speaking into some of the issues that were being faced in the Corinthian church because of how messed up they were and the divisions that they were experiencing and the fact that they were coming together for the Lord's Supper and the rich were eating all the food and not sharing it with the poor and people were getting drunk and all these things were happening in the church. There was rudeness happening. And Paul is saying, that is not the kind of love that Jesus demonstrated. We are not rude to one another, but we are kind to one another. Love is not self-seeking. This is the one that is probably the hardest for our culture to get, that love is not self-seeking, because everywhere you look for a definition of love in our culture, it's all about me, putting me in the center. Young people, listen to the words of the songs that you're, you're listening to. Pay attention to Justin Bieber when he sings about love. And I'm not downing Justin Bieber, but just listen to how he thinks about love. Love is what you do for me. Love is how you make me feel, baby. Love is that you take me to heaven. And as long as you do those things for me, I'm gonna, we have love. But as soon as I am not in the center, then love is over. But this is not the kind of love that Jesus demonstrated. Jesus demonstrated a kind of love that says, you first. How can I serve you? What do you need? What can I give for you so that you can have what you need and that you can be blessed? That's what Jesus' kind of love looks like. Love is not easily angered. This goes back to patience. When I love somebody, when I'm other-focused, I'm going to be patient with them. I'm going to bear long with their shortcomings and, and, and their weaknesses. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Boom. Wow. If we could just apply that one. If we just apply that one in all of our relationships, in all of our friendships, in all of our marriages, that we would be willing to drop the lists, the records that we carry around of what you did to me, of what you didn't do to me or for me, of what you said to me, of what you didn't say. If we could just learn to live, as Jesus did, in this perpetual state of forgiveness. 
letting it go, letting it go, dropping it, letting it go, keeping no records of wrong. How revolutionary would that be in our culture if we could keep no record of wrongs? Paul goes on to say, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. In other words, if I love you, I'm not happy when you suffer a setback or you lose your job or get caught in sin or fall in some way. But that love delights in truth, and truth here is contrasted to evil. So truth here is virtue and goodness and righteousness, that we, de- we delight in these things. That's when someone succeeds, when someone gets ahead, when someone does the right thing and they get caught doing it, we rejoice with that. But when someone suffers a setback or sins or falls, that we grieve with them, sincerely grieve. That's what love looks like. And Paul ends this definition of love by saying love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So love continues to lean in. Love continues to hope. Love continues to see the good in the other. Love continues to believe positive intent behind every word and every action. And when things are difficult and when relationship is hard, love continues to hope. Love continues to persevere. That's why love never fails. And I hope we see here that the kind of love being talked about by Paul here is not primarily an emotion. This is not about a feeling, but it's about a verb. It's about something we do, something we we could choose to do. I can choose to continue to hope. I can choose to continue to lean in. I can choose to continue to look for the positive in what we have. I can choose to continue to love you. Wow. If, If all the Christians in the United States just began to define love in the way Paul defined love in these short four verses, and we began to live it, what might happen in our culture? if we were actually like living like this and loving like this and going to the places where hatred is being demonstrated and just loving, what might happen? You know, it just strikes me that this definition of love is so powerful. It tells us so much about God, who he is. It tells us so much about what love is. It tells us about sin. It tells us about gospel. Just think about it. God is love. The Bible makes it clear. God is primarily love. And so this description we just read is actually a description of God. That we could take the word love out of this chapter and replace it with God, and we would have perhaps the most compelling, the most accurate picture of who God is and what he has done. Why don't we try it? Think about this. God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy. God does not boast. God is not proud. God is not rude. God is not self-seeking. God is not easily angered. God keeps no record of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but God rejoices with the truth. God always protects. God always trusts. God always hopes. God always perseveres. God never fails. Is that the picture that you have of God in your mind? As you think about who he is or what his character is or how he is toward you, how he feels toward you, how he's acting toward you, is this the picture that you get? Because this is who he is. And this is how he has acted toward you and how he feels toward you and what he wants to do for you. But more than just telling us who God is, this this definition of love also lets us see who we are and how short of God's high standard we fall. Think about this. We're commanded to love by Jesus. We're commanded to love as Jesus loved. And here is the definition of that love. And what that means is we're in a world of hurt. Right? I mean, if this is God's expectation for me, that I love the way he does, that I love like this, I'm in a world of hurt. Because if I break this commandment, I am sinning. When I break this commandment, this is the very thing that nails Christ to the cross. And we don't often think about that. When we think about the sin that nailed Jesus to the cross, the sin that held him there, the the, the horrible sin that made him have to go through something so excruciating and horrible as a crucifix, we think about things like murder and child abuse and robbery. We think about those big ones. 
We don't think that it's my failure to love that would hold Jesus to the cross, but that's exactly what it is. That when I am impatient, I am sinning. That when I am unkind, that I am falling short of God's standard. That when I envy or when I boast or when I'm proud, when I keep a record of wrongs, that when I do all of these things listed in, in 1 Corinthians 13 about what love is not, I am doing things that put him on the cross, and I am falling so far short of his standard. And so if you ever are tempted to think, I'm a pretty good person. You know what? I know all these other people, they think that they need a Savior. I don't need a Savior. I could do fine just by myself. I can get into heaven just by myself. Just consider this definition of love and ask how well you're doing at it. And if you're anything like me, you're going to realize, I'm in deep need of a Savior. I'm in deep need of grace. And that's what brings us full circle back to this definition of love and that God is all of it. And it brings us back to a God who is patient and kind and long-suffering and keeps no record of wrongs. A God who is quick to forgive and quick to restore. And we come to this God who is perfect in love like this. And we receive everything that we need for life. We come to this God in Christ who has already paid the penalty for my falling short in not loving the way that I should. This is the gospel, and this is what we see right here in 1 Corinthians 13. And Paul is going to end this chapter by talking about the, the ultimate fulfillment of this kind of love. And this is what he says. He says, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. So here Paul is contrasting in the spiritual gifts to love, and he's saying, you know what, all the spiritual gifts that we have right now, they're temporary. And when Jesus comes again, none of them will be needed anymore. You know, prophecy, you think we're going to need prophecy once Jesus comes again? You think a person's going to need to speak for God? No, God will speak for himself. We will hear him. We'll hear his voice. We're not going to need tongues. We're all going to speak the same language. We're not going to need knowledge. He's going to be right there in front of us. We're not going to need faith anymore. We're going to see him. He's going to be right in front of us. I will be out of a job when Jesus comes again. Our spiritual gifts will no longer be needed. That's what Paul is saying. Once Jesus comes, they all go away. He continues, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. In other words, what he's saying here again, there's a time for some things, and there's a time to leave certain things behind. And right now we're in the time when we need spiritual gifts, and everyone's a part of the body, and God has given us these gifts so that we could function. But a time is coming when Jesus comes again, and we go to heaven, we're going to put those things away. And he finishes by saying this. Now we see, but a poor reflection is in a mirror. And their mirrors in the first century were mostly polished bronze, and they can kind of see themselves. That's what Paul's talking about. But then... We shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So what Paul is saying again is, yeah, we got faith. That's great. Faith is very important right, right now. We have hope. Hope is very important right now. But the greatest of these is love. Because love is the only one that will endure. Love is the only one that we will take from this life into the life to come. That once Jesus comes again, we will take the love that he has for us and the love that we have for him, the love that we have for one another, and we will love and be loved forever and ever and ever. This chapter is incredibly compelling to me. I want to love like this. But this chapter is also incredibly convicting to me because I realize how far short I fall continually, every day. You know, it's something that I want to grow in. And as I look at my 25 years of following Jesus, I can see signs of growth. But then there are some days where I'm just, I'm just like, I'm not getting anywhere on this. I mean, there I go again, same thing I've been doing for 25 years. Years. And so I'm always setting these goals for myself, ways that I'm trying to, to grow, to be more loving. I remember in 2013, and in 2012, I kind of had to, you know, I was like, all right, this year I'm going to do something. 2013, some of you know this if you're here, I determined that every day of the year I was going to meditate on and recite 1 Corinthians 13. And every day I would start by going through 1 Corinthians 13, this definition of love. I would reflect on it. 
I would reflect on my previous day. I would think about all the ways, allow the Holy Spirit to tell me all the ways that I fell short. I would confess that to God. I would make lists of people that I would need to go and talk to, to ask you know, forgiveness for because I was unloving. And then I would just imagine my day. I would imagine the places where I would need to go that day, the places where it might be hard to exhibit love. And I would just ask God to be with me in that time so that I could be more loving. And I would just focus on God's love for me. And I would receive that love. And it was a powerful uh, year for me, 2013. I think I grew some that year. And my growth was put to a, the test very early in the year because in February of 2013, my wife and I, we went on a trip uh, through Europe. We were on a tour with a bunch of pastors. And it was a great trip. We saw all these historical sites uh, throughout uh, Europe that were you know, kind of connected with the, the, the Protestant Revolution, and or Reformation, excuse me. But for some reason, the trip leader wasn't very fond of me, uh, didn't like me a lot, and made it real clear. So on one of our first days, we were, we were in the city of Berlin, and we were touring this particular large cathedral. And as we entered into this cathedral, the, the tour guide's wife pulled me aside and said, make sure you ask my husband how to get to the top of the dome, because if you can find the stairs to the top of the dome, you've got great views of the city. And so I said, great. So I, I looked around for a couple minutes, and then I went and I found the leader, and I said, hey, um, can you tell me how to find the the steps up to the top of the dome. And, and this leader looked at his watch, and he looked at me, and he said, you don't have time to make it to the top of the dome. And I, that was kind of curious to me, because I knew we had an hour there, and we'd only been there for about 10 minutes, and I was sure I could make it to the top and back in 50 minutes. And so I just kind of walked away, and I said, all right, I'll find the stairs by myself. And so I went, and I looked for the stairs. I found the stairs in a couple minutes. A bunch of pastors were following me, so we went up, enjoyed the, the view from the top of the dome. We came back down. We enjoyed the cathedral. It was getting time to leave, and they were really stressing punctuality, be back to the bus on time, and I wanted to be a team player. So I started heading out of the building, out of the cathedral, and there I see the, t- the, the group leader talking with a group of my friends, and so I, I stepped up and joined the conversation. I saw I had a couple minutes, and they were talking about stuff about men, and I just kind of listened in, and then the group leader looks at me, and he said, Kennedy, do you want to know what real men don't do? I can think of a lot of things, but um, (laughs) I'll take the bait. What do real men not do? He said, they don't run in church. That's not helping me. Um, Why are you telling me that real men don't run in church? Because I know that you just ran to the top of the dome and back down, and you got a bunch of pastors to do it with you. There's no way you could have made it in time otherwise. And I don't know how fast he goes upstairs and down, but we did not need to run. It was... Now, full disclosure here, later this evening, this leader would be admitted to a hospital because he was having a weird reaction to uh, some medicines. I did not know that at the time. And so you will understand my reaction when I just kind of looked at him quizzically. And first I told him, I assure you, I did not run to the top of the dome. So hopefully I'm still a real man. I'm going to step away from this conversation now. So I went out to the bus because I wanted to be on time. I got on the bus. And uh, right, right on time. And then I hear over the microphone in the bus, Kennedy, you're late. It was the team, mem- t- team leader's wife. The team leader wasn't even back yet, but now I'm late. I looked at my watch. I'm certainly not late. I'm right on time, but okay. I, we, we sat in the back of the bus and waited. And I just kind of <laughs> breathed. And then the team leader came back, and he gets to the front of the bus, and everyone's on the bus now. We're getting ready to pull out. And he gets on the microphone, and he said, someone on the bus has a public apology that they'd like to make to the entire group. I'm thinking, finally, I'm going to get vindicated here. He's going to apologize for accusing me of running to the top of the dome, and he's going to apologize for calling me late when I wasn't late, and I was five minutes quicker than him. He said, Kennedy. Kennedy's going to apologize for being late. He's going to apologize to everybody. And I started to react, and I started to have unkind thoughts and about things that I was going to say. And that's when my wife was sitting right next to me, and I love her so much. She's so beautiful. She put her hand on mine. She knew what I was doing that year, and she simply whispered three words. 1 Corinthians 13. (laughs) I love my wife. And I was convicted in that moment. My heart melted. I was convicted by the Holy Spirit and my wife that this was an opportunity to love that even though I felt I was completely in the right, Jesus was in the right, and yet he took the penalty for our sake. And so I stood up, 
and I publicly apologized to everyone for being late. I promised it would never happen again, and I sat back down. And you may not think that's a big deal, but for me, that was a major (laughs) victory for the kingdom of God. That was not expected. Okay. My question to you then is, where do you need to experience these victories in your life? What does love look like? What does it look like to grow in this kind of Christ-like love? Where do you have the hardest time? How can you prepare yourself to be ready for those times? And let me just say, as we close, I don't want anyone here to leave with the idea that the way to live this or the way to love like this is just to try harder. It's not just to muscle up your willpower and make this resolve that you're going to be more loving and try harder because it doesn't work. Believe me, I've tried hundreds of times. This is not something that we can do on our own. We can't muscle it. The only thing that we can do, the only way that we can love like Jesus is to go to the source. And so let me encourage you, if this is important to you, if you want to love the way Jesus loved, to set aside time every morning and just meditate on and come to his love. Maybe you need to look at a piece of, of Christian artwork with Jesus on the cross or, or read a passage about Jesus on the cross or do it like I did and meditate on 1 Corinthians 13 every morning and just kind of go over it in your heart and picture the places where it's going to be difficult and confess the places where you've already fallen short and ask for God's grace in those places where you know you're going to have the hardest times and just keep going and keep going and keep going because this is the thing that will define us. This is the thing that is the highest value in God's kingdom and our world needs it now more than ever and if it isn't us who's doing it, the followers of him who loved best, then who will it be? Let's pray together. Our Father, Thank you for loving us first and loving us so well through Christ. Thank you for knowing exactly what we needed and giving us exactly that. Father, we pray that your love would not only save us, but it would transform us. That you would give us the power to love one another as you first loved us. And may all the world stand up and take notice of what you're doing among us and be drawn to you through it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.